if I want to flourish or an arpeggio, instead of doing like, you know, doing some sort of scalar thing, my hands might take a shape like this, and that might be the shape that I'm arpeggiating. You know, if you let your left hand lead, it's got really interesting things to say. When you're playing, there's a sense of meditation that is like deep listening that doesn't always involve your conscious brain. We kind of forget to practice that other 50%. The things that we don't want to do, I think I was put in the world to play piano and play it live, you know, like that's what I want to do. Hey everybody, and welcome to today's episode of Jazz Lab. I'm ridiculously excited to have an incredible pianist and old friend and teacher, Taylor Ikesy, with us today. Taylor is one of those musicians who just really goes without needing introduction, as many guests are on this podcast, but I have literally been, you know, a fan and student of Taylor's for, I mean, at least 15 years now. So, um, you know, when I was at the Brubeck Institute, we always had the privilege of, you know, going to the, the Berkeley Jazz School and getting to hang with Taylor. And, um, you know, you always opened up my mind every single lesson, but I'm going to stop you know, just perseverating here. Instead, jump into your bio for a second here, Taylor. So, Taylor Eichste is a Grammy award-winning pianist who started playing the piano when he was four years old. Growing up in Menlo Park, California, Eichste was quickly labeled a prodigy and has since released eight albums as a band leader, in addition to appearing on over 60 albums as a sideman. Eichste recently won a 2022 Grammy Award for Best Contemporary Instrumental Album for his most recent album, Tree Falls released in 2021 on GSI Records and has also garnered three individual Grammy nominations over the years for his work as a recording artist and composer, including Best Instrumental Composition and Best Jazz Instrumental Solo. And of course, Taylor has been featured on all sorts of other albums, some of which are Grammy nominated, has been on tour with all sorts of people, Chris Bodie, Joshua Redman, Sting, Dave Brubeck, John Mayer, Esperanza Spaulding, and this list goes on for about uh, 20 more lines, so I'm just going to stop there. Um, but welcome, Taylor. Thank you so much for being here. So excited to pick your brain today. Yeah, man. My pleasure. I also want to say a huge thanks to Casio for sponsoring today's episode. More on that later. Today, I would love to maybe give some folks a taste of some of the stuff that you've taught me over the years and also ask you some questions. The new record is absolutely phenomenal and every record, it just goes to a new level of, you know, prodigiousness. So definitely want to pick your brain about that. Let's jump into some questions here. So on your new record, one thing that I came to notice is, well, actually two things. Number one, you are one of the most clean players that I've ever heard. Hearing you make a mistake is, is very unlikely, I'll say. And I do specifically remember having this conversation with you many years ago about how important that uh, attention to detail and cleanliness is for you as an improviser. So I'm kind of curious, is that still something that you think about? And is it still important to you? And how did you go about basically, you know, ingraining that in your playing? Yeah, um, well, uh, I'll just start by saying that I, I definitely make... Um a slew of mistakes. I'm a firm believer that 50% of stuff that we set out to play, we intend on playing. And then 50% just happens. And it's reactions in one way or another, you know, reactions to something happening uh, or reaction, uh, tension and release. So reactions to silence by playing something or anything else. So it's kind of a series of questions and answers. And I think it reflects life in that way where, you know, you might have a to-do list and everything. And then you're like, ah, crap, I got this email that, you know, now I got to go pick this other thing up and, and you know, that's going to take me forever. And like, you know, our days are filled with things that we set out to do and then things that we react to and just happen. And so I think when we're improvising, um, one of the things that I've found really can I, kind of con connects you with um, perhaps what your own sound is, is, is um, when you fail at emulating others, you know, and, and when, when, when you acknowledge that something and embrace that something is always going to happen that you didn't intend on. And so as far as like the cleanliness of lines and things like that, I think some of the biggest things are just pl practicing slow over the years, you know, be being able to just really sit with something. I think the body remembers things that you practice um, without a sense of space time continuum. I think, I think if you practice something slow, your body just remembered you know, you practice that really cleanly and and um, and accurately. I, there was times I had a lesson with Benny Green when I was about fourteen or fifteen, and and he, I I could kind of do all sorts of uh, you know little sloppy. 
you know, like just two hand kind of stuff. But it's ultimately it's, it's kind of sloppy, and it's not certainly not um, how Benny does that, <laughs> you know. And so he just sat me down in a practice room. He kept inching the metronome slower, 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 and then eventually Benny told me in his uh, rather iconic uh, speech cadence that I'm not going to imitate now, but I, I I can do a good imitation. Um, it's all out of love, but uh, but he told me Taylor, you know. The metronome doesn't go any slower. You know, he basically was like, I'm going to keep putting this down until you play all of this really cleanly and feel good about it. But we got down to 40, and I was like, I realized just how much work someone like Benny has put in, you know, to kind of develop that sound and have that physicality in his fingers that allows him to do that. Um, and I think it really starts by practicing slow. Um, and then the other thing that I think contributes to a sense of clarity that I always at least try to search for when I'm playing is um, embracing the inevitable 50% that you don't plan on. And so some components of that for me also involve a, not over transcribing because that can get um, uh, physical remnants of phrases in your hand that show up in some places where they don't belong, you know. I think it can be great to like try to understand different vocabulary by different people and sometimes the danger of that going so far into that world is like it, you can put physical muscle memory in your hands that is out of context. Because a lot of times, you know, when we're playing, it's like there is a sense of autopilot that I think is okay because we're human beings, you know. You've got to think about like, Oh my God, they showed up. Like you're looking out at and find, is someone particular showed up to your show or something. You're like, oh man. And then you're thinking about, you know, some, some Instagram message that you got that pissed you off and something else. And then just like all of these things are going on. There's so much things to, so many things to think about. And so you got to let your hands do some of the work for you and be able to trust them to, um, to, to be focused even when your mind kind of, you know, which is, I think, um, I don't meditate too often, but when, when I do meditate, my, some of my initial holdups about it were like, my brain is spinning. Like I want to just get totally silent in my head. But, and I think a lot of times they tell you like, that's okay to acknowledge, like there's always going to be thoughts swimming around. And so I think when you're playing, there's a sense of meditation that happens that kind of to me is like deep listening that doesn't always involve your conscious brain and some of it seeps into the uh, muscle memory. And so when I've um, practiced over the years, I've always tried to practice in a way where I would um, have pretty fluid fingering, practicing slow with accents and, you know, major scales. I tend to have a number of different practice routines so that uh, like if I only have five minutes or something, my most frequent practice routine, to be honest, is standing at the side of the stage doing this. Because, um, you know, a lot of times, it, it, you know, if we're at sound check and, you know, drums are, he's tuning the toms and everything. We're trying to get monitors. And the groups I play in sometimes have like string quartet and like all these other kind of things going on and electronics and visuals. And, and so uh, not that much time to just sit there and kind of like work out, you know, pra like really practice stuff. So occasionally sometimes practicing comes in the form of a chaotic intro where I can at least get my fingers warmed up or, or standing on the side of the stage doing that. At the same time as practicing scales, I think that represents in a way there's so many things in every tune, if you look at major scales, where it's diatonic harmony, where I would say the vast majority of, of chords that show up in things that we do, even if it's, you know, e e even if it's like a complicated chord, like D major 7 sharp 11 over F sharp, you know, you know, you're still dealing with... You're dealing with an A major scale in that case. And so when I practice scales, I try not to start on the root and end on the root. I try to treat each note as one out of seven so that, you know, if I'm looking at this um, and that harmony is appropriate on like a B minor 11, let's say, I don't want my hand and kind of my uh, subconscious to instantly think like, oh, I got to start here because that's A major. I want to just treat it as seven notes where I could you know, where I could start wherever, finish wherever and things. And I think to achieve that, I found it really helpful to practice 50% of the time. I practice major scales in that way to represent that 50% that like we intend on doing. And then I practice totally random eighth notes and treat it like a geography exercise of just getting around the piano's range and fluidity and keeping fingering going. And ultimately uh, what that does is it helps me practice uh, my mistakes. We kind of forget to practice 
that other 50%, you know, the things that we don't want to do. Because if you're in the middle of the line and you're playing and your finger slips or you play something else, which you'll do every time, which is why every solo is different, which I think it, it's a, ultimately a great thing and some to embrace. But a lot of times some, some folks will be so uh, adamant about playing the thing that they're trying to play that when they don't, there's some frustration that seeps in and kind of like backing off of those notes and things like that. And I truly believe that there's a way to make anything work over every chord that there is. And like, even if it's A minor or something and you take something that doesn't really feel like it works, like B flat minor, if there's something. That was the first thing I thought of that doesn't work, but it's a half step away from something that does. I practice random eighth notes in the same articulation that I do uh, major scales. So major scales will kind of sound like this when I'm practicing them. into stuff on my table here but uh <laughs> practicing with accents it's it's uh i like to practice in the way that i'm gonna play there was a football coach that coached the 49ers in the 80s he was really successful bill walsh and um in some of his coaching methods um most of also my life i take from just like football metaphors so bear me bear with me there but he you know he switched up a lot of their workout routines where instead of running laps it was only getting that same exercise from running routes or um things that you know it was football moves things that you actually use in the game because um every time i've sat down and practiced things that i don't really play in that way like if i'm practicing major scales like You just taught your body to play a little bit more like that, you know. So it's it's a physical thing. So um, if I'm playing over a tune, um, with no accents, you know. You know, it kind of instantly loses things. And so when I'm practicing, if I'm practicing major scales, I like to include those accents, alternating accents, because. You know, if I'm playing something like that, it's going to have those accents. And usually maybe not that I'm deliberately exaggerating them a little bit right now. But when the tempo gets faster and you're playing faster things, you want to make sure that your emphasis and your drive and kind of like the momentum and what the wave that you're riding is on the right side of the beat and feels good, you know. The emphasis and so, is on the right syllable, of course. Exactly, exactly. So and then so when I'm practicing uh, random eighth notes, what um, the the entire in intent is not to get anyone to play more randomly. It's just to be able to embrace when things are unknown, you know, when it's random input, because a mistake is random input, you know, a suggestion from an audience of a chord in the middle of a tune is random input. Um, but when you when your fingers do something you didn't intend on doing, instantly, that's got to be you got to treat that like, well, you didn't not play that, you know, and so finding ways that integrates, it, integrating that into a line. When I'm practicing uh, random eighth notes, it's going to be that same articulation. So with that same articulation, you know, when there's things where tune comes up, like, uh, I mean, shoot, it's the, I overused autumn leaves like left and right with little examples. But, you know, if I'm playing and there's like, you know, a chord that doesn't fit in autumn leaves, th theoretically, like E7 or something, let's say. So if I'm playing a line, here's E7, here's A flat minor. B half diminished. E flat half diminished. G 
major. And in anything I was playing, I wouldn't have played unless those things. You, sometimes it's it, that's easier to do when it's not my own brain trying to think of a random chord that doesn't fit. Um, uh, but you know, those situations uh, always are going to come out. And so I think part of getting a clarity in your sound is knowing how to utilize those mistakes. You know, like um, I think there's an interview of Oscar Peterson where he talks about that too, where. Um, he says he makes a mistake in every solo. If Oscar Peterson made a mistake in every solo, we're all screwed. So, you know, there, why try to avoid it? Just embrace the fact that there's going to be something unknown that happens. And then um, I always wanted to kind of dedicate my approach to trying to just embrace, anticipate, and look forward to those moments that make every solo different. And by doing that, too... Um, it enables kind of a, a, a lot more clarity physically. You know, if I'm practicing major uh, major scales and then random eighth notes, by the way, if I only have five minutes or 10 minutes to practice, that's the two things that I'm doing. So in terms of, you know, if you have longer times to practice than 10 minutes, there's a whole bunch of other things that I might do, but. So yeah, what if you, what if you did have, you know, let's say a, a full two hours to practice? What are, you know, off the top of your head, some things that are, are really important that you personally like to, to work on? If I had two hours to practice, I'd probably put my right hand behind my back for 45 minutes and um, generally try to feel uncomfortable and just play with my left hand. And then uh, after about 45 minutes, you bring your right hand back in and uh, it's got to lean on your left hand now. You know, So my left hand, I tried to, over the years, think of it less like the dumb younger brother in my right hand and, and more like the the wise arthritic grandpa where it's you know if you let your left hand lead it's got really interesting things to say and um i think part of the reasons why a lot of us don't use our left hand more is just out of fear or it, there's a little bit of that fear of the unknown built into it you know we're just even on the tactile landscape of our right hand doing something that you know, that's, we know we can zip around with our right hand. We're like, oh, I've done that. I've been there before. That's cool. And then the left hand, it's a little bit like, you know, even just the arm movement of what it feels like to do a run downwards while you're doing some, playing something here. And so sometimes there's some independence exercises and, and things like that that I might work on. Ultimately, like there was a lot of exercises just over time I, I, I kind of came up with that you know, would help me address some of those things specifically. And I, and I, I would encourage anyone listening to, to, um, kind of create and make up your own exercises and kind of keep making them different every time. If you have a longer time to practice than like, you know, 10 minutes or a half an hour, I'd say find a balance between doing things, doing some things that you do every time, you know, that are, that are just real mechanical, like, um, for me, practicing random eighth notes is like practicing long tones. It just like helps the fluidity of the fingers so that anything that happens, it's like in a nanosecond, you can include it in the harmony and make sense of it, which I think a lot of times, if you're just aiming for the notes that you originally intended, then there's like a little bit of failure built into that. Now you're leaving things hanging. Now you're, it's not working out and everything. And, but if you embrace that mentality that it's always going to work out, but it's going to work, it's going to look different and sound different than what you initially thought, then it's exciting because it's kind of like, to some degree, the piano will tell you what to play. And it helps me become a better listener too. Cause I can, I, I can, you know, support and, and take a listen first mentality and not get so concerned with my fingers and hands and what they're doing. I think part of that autopilot is a deeply focused listening. So, um, you know, that, that kind of a thing has always been important to me, but you know, there's, there's, there's some independence things that I might do. There's a few straight warmups there that are the exception of my role of like trying to only practice things that you're going to play. Like there's one that's a Rachmaninoff exercise that I think Rachmaninoff and kind of goes down chromatically there. I wouldn't usually play in that way when I'm playing, really, but it, it there's nothing that gets the blood kind of pumping into the fingers like that. So that's that's just one thing I'd do just to kind of wake my fingers up and, and, and that sort of a thing. The times that I get these days to like just sit down and just straight up uh, practice. It's not, it's, it's, it's a bit, unfortunately not that off, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely become a thing where, um, it's very infrequent where I get a chance to sit down and properly practice to that, to that degree. Plus there's, there's actually a number of different specific groups that I play in where I, I like the way that I play in that group 
better if I don't touch the piano for three or four days before before that gig. There's things where a good friend of mine, uh, Eldar, a uh, great pianist, uh, we've done some duo shows. Those shows, I like kind of getting a nice three hours of practicing in before because um, dude is a, a technical wizard and um, and we can definitely play together in a way that that I think is really cool. I'm just kind of like, I want to at least kind of make sure that I'm feeling very you know, ready to go and limber and all that kind of stuff. And then there's certain groups where I deliberately want to limit how effortlessly noty I get. You know, there's some groups where I I feel like I'm better suited in a role where I play chords and I maybe a rhythmic role, that kind of a thing. I used to do that in shows with uh, Eric Harlan's group uh, called Voyager. And um, in that band, there's Julian Lodge, Walter Smith, myself, Harish Raghavan, and, and um and Julian and Walter are the main cat and mouse in that band. And that's kind of like, if I feel too warmed up, I'm going to want to get in there and stuff. And, you know, and then you got three voices and stuff. And it's just kind of like, I know my role in that band. Would, and, it, you know, when it comes to me soloing and all that kind of stuff, like, sure, you know, if there's moments where in the larger sound, the piano has to make like, pull off some fireworks or something. Cool, all for it. But the majority of time, I like to kind of like feel out where my uh, best textural role would be. And for that particular band, you know, with my hands when I'm not warmed up, when I haven't practiced, for me, it 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 um the type of mistake it'll be an increase in mistakes or unexpected notes. But the type of uh, increased unexpected notes, I really like for that. You know, it'll be some chords that maybe I wouldn't have played a certain chord that 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 you know I, I maybe I wouldn't have sat down and played this maybe I would have maybe I would have played something that was a little bit more automatic or something when I see like um, a c7 flat nine or whatever but I don't want to actually play that chord I want to lead off with a chord where I can work my way in you know if I, if I've been warming up forever and stuff I personally if I see a c7 flat nine or something then you know then sure you know whatever like I might just play this you know the simplest thing that could come to mind but if I haven't warmed up or let's say I haven't played in four or five days or something I might play something like that creates more jams for me to get uh work my way out of and I like that in terms of how it plays on um just internal voice leading and things like times where I haven't touched the piano in four to seven days and I sit down it's just, it feels so good to just have little little internal uh, voice leading things and uh, little lines that like where I really don't know where it's going to go or what's going to happen. And so I think more times than not, you're going to arrive at a gig and just not feel warmed up or properly you know, it, it's just, it's, it's got to become a comfort zone. It's got to become like the, the, the mentality that you're used to where you're like, that's okay. That's, I know what this feels like. I know how to play this music when I don't have the luxury of getting, it's the other thing about practicing two, three hours a day is then when all of a sudden, you know, you don't get that opportunity, then it's like the rug is yanked from under you, you know? And so if your comfort zone is practicing and then you just don't feel right unless you practice for three hours, we don't have pianos in most of the hotel rooms that we stay at as traveling pianists. So um, other than, you know, the occasional, like I can think of a couple of venues where they, they have a piano in the hotel and I'm like, ah, it's pretty dope. But, you know, it really just doesn't happen. Like we don't have something that we can usually shed in the hotel room. So um, for me, that had to, kind of become the comfort zone and also some of the best advice that I ever was uh, witnessed it was uh, Nicholas Payton talking to Julian Lodge once we were in the Caribbean we we're all doing this festival down there and I remember Nick told Julian practice when you're pissed off tired uh, hungry upset you know all, all of these kind of because he's like 90 percent of the time you're going to be in one of those kind of mentalities and you got to get ideas out and be a good listener and 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 you know, be a musician that tries to make all of the other musicians better. And all of those things have to still come out when you're having a crappy day. And so, you know, I just think being aware and being um, uh, and expecting kind of unexpected and possibly like un unsavory situations, you know, like that's because that's going to be we're going to be in that all the time. And we got to be able to play through it and stuff. And so I know sometimes, too, when I've had some crazy sad things happen, and but I have a show that night and I got to get through it and everything, 
it does help me to be able to work through that on the piano because it really then can become there for you and stuff. But if you never practice when you're sad, tired, hungry, ex- upset, angry, you know, then it's harder to know how to even get ideas out when that idea, when that emotion comes up on the gig or um, in those situations. I think just, you know, it's it's kind of like if you practice at home smelling peppermint oil, have a little peppermint oil on the gig, you know, have like have it next, you know, so so that you can, it's those things of like how you practice is basically really just telling your body do do that a little bit more, you know, and so those ways that we where we can simulate some of those things um, when we're actually done on the gig, that's why I think it's so important to practice, especially when you don't feel like practicing. You ever practice wearing like a suit or something like that? That's a really interesting. Um, I think I exclusively wear basketball shorts in the home. <laughs> so uh, if I had a suit, would have had <laughs> would have had warrior shorts underneath. But um, I actually have in one situation too, especially if I've gotten like a new suit or jacket or something like that, and I want to like at least see how it can kind of stretch around and stuff. So, but it's um, that's a good example. You know, there's actually there's there's even things where I did a for this last record, and so I did a release show at uh, Le Poisson Rouge in New York. Um, uh, last year and it it it, it uh, was really fun and you know like nice packed rock club with people standing and every the ener- energy felt so great and uh, I had I had put so much time in like into that two hour plus set of mostly original music and we had all sorts of big group I was so prepared on those levels I was like ready for that show and then I decided to try to introduce the band over a vamp and I realized that I'm like. Oh, I didn't practice this. So even holding a microphone in my hand and like trying to um, <laughs> trying to keep this vamp up in my left hand and then talk in a totally different rhythm, I realized right in that moment, like, oh, I left that out. I should have practiced that, you know. So those things, actually, practicing announcing is is something that for any um, band leaders listening, you know, that's that's something that there's no shame in that, like working that out. And sometimes, especially if someone's new at it, you know, I don't think there's any shame in jotting out a couple notes or you give yourself a little script and run through it. Shows where I've done that, it always leads to a better result. At least I'm more um, focused and because I, I always have to put the mic away from the piano. If I have the mic, the talk mic next to the piano, I get too distracted by the piano itself. So I start looking down at the piano. And I'm like, ooh, what's this chord? You know, like I just start, um, although it wouldn't be that chord. That chord is like, we. Uh, everyone's heard that chord. I, I wouldn't be intrigued by that chord. Well, speaking of uh, that chord, let me interrupt you for a second and ask you. It's not bad. You know, it's no, okay. it's not a bad chord. It's like tried and true. Yeah. <laughs> The eighth hardware of chords, yeah. Absolutely. Now, before we continue, I just want to take a second to thank Casio again for sponsoring this episode. The keyboard in front of me is actually the Casio Privia PXS6000. This is part of their new Privia line. As you can see, this is just a visually gorgeous keyboard that I've been using for many months now, and I'm absolutely loving having it as my daily practice piano. They've taken the time to really make this a beautiful instrument to both look at and actually physically use. The key bed is really nice, it's fairly quiet, I love it. Again, I've been practicing on it sometimes hours a day consistently, and it feels great on my hands. I feel like I've been making a lot of progress, and I've always just enjoyed sitting down to play it. It also may sound silly, but for me, the visual aesthetic of an instrument is actually really, really important. And some of the details of this design have also really led to me loving this instrument even more. For example, there's actual spruce on the sides of the keys. Those little touches really help it feel like a real piano. There's also wood style paneling, which helps the aesthetic love these stands and of course the actual interface is all just controlled by touch with these little lights and it's just a really simple minimalistic looking keyboard again i've really fallen in love with this instrument as far as digital pianos go this is one of my favorites that i've used and one of the most comparable experiences that i've had to an actual real piano Huge thanks again to Casio for sponsoring today's video and supporting this kind of educational content. I hope you're getting a lot out of today's episode. And if you're interested in learning more about the Privia line, check out the affiliate link in the description of this video. And if you're streaming this podcast, you can also just go to noahkelman.com slash Casio and you will find the affiliate link there. All right, right back to the episode. So I was wondering if you could actually walk us through a little bit your approach to working on voicings and voicing freedom, what are some exercises that people could work on to build a really great arsenal of voicings or however you would think of it or approach it? Sure. I won't go down the full deep dive rabbit rabbit hole of some of my 
approach the voicings and stuff, which I think you probably heard back in the day too. Um, and my mentality is very much the same, but I'll give a, I'll give a nutshell version. Um, I look at creating voicings and harmony from the standpoint of like, what's going to, what's going to texturally serve this tune? You know, where's the tension and release? I play with a lot of vocalists. And so when I'm doing that, um, I want to be able to contextualize sometimes and and maybe personify some of the lyrics in different ways. And if someone sings like the open sky or something, and maybe, you know, maybe I'm playing bigger, open, spread out intervals, but if they're saying like, hold you so close to me, I might, you know, you know, there might be things that are, that are indicative of the lyrics, but I don't have to think about chords, which is really, really nice. And it's been that way for a long time, um, largely because I've kind of been able to address through a, a number of different exercises and just practicing over time ways of allowing my hands to the physical muscle, muscle memory of my hands naturally hunts for shapes that don't have redundant notes. So, you know, if you're playing block chords and stuff, if that's your style, you know, it's kind of built on redundant notes. So, uh, you know, stylistic, I just don't get called for those kind of gigs usually, um, and which I'm very much at peace with. But, but nonetheless, uh, I think that chords sound dramatically better when they don't have repeats in them. And what you're ultimately left with is a physical shape on the piano. And that physical shape is going to dictate what that chord sounds sounds like. Sometimes I use the example of um, So What, where I'm not so sure if it would have been a hit tune if instead of you have this, you know, they're all different notes. If you took in your left hand and uh, you just repeated the F that you're playing up here and, and the G in this harmony, and just one repeat, just listen to how crappy it is. So the second you throw any redundant notes in a chord, sometimes with obvious exceptions and stuff, and maybe if you want like an octave on top or things like that, um, you know, I, I, I like having situations where, um, you know, uh, maybe it's a, an octave with a, with a half step apart, things like that. I think there's exceptions to that, certainly, and it's not a 100% thing. But if, you're, if my hands hunt for... Um, just chords and, and voicings that are, that are shapes that are comprised of all different notes, not only does it have a sense of punching out more and it's got a lot more clarity and the proper balance of the harmony, but the, pia the piano itself will sound better. So if you have a piano that's a little out of tune, you know, the second you start doubling up notes, you're, you're calling that tuning into question. And, um, uh, and the internal voice leading to just navigate and snake around becomes so much easier when primarily the shapes that you play are comprised of just all different notes. So now in terms of, I can just think big shapes, little shapes, I can think, I can paint when I'm playing now because I don't have to think about like the theory behind the chords or memorizing anything or whatever. I allow my hands to find those, um, those places. And I know I'm going to have a lot of luck with that usually because my hands don't, um, they don't, like if I play a chord that has a lot of repeats in it, it feels physically wrong, you know? And so the way that I kind of try to train myself, train the muscle memory over the years has been an exercise that I have always referred to as the 49 chords exercise. I'll also say that any things that I, that I share here, I always try to get this out that for better or worse, this is just, it's always going to be like the way that I did it, you know, which worked for me. And I, I always feel morally weird, weird about giving anyone any information that's like not the way that I practice it and stuff. So you know, sometimes when I talk about some of this stuff, people bring up like, um, you know, if it's okay for people to have their own variations and all that others. And it's like, of course, I just, you know, I feel the most authentic, at least just telling, telling folks like what I did, because it for better or worse, it worked, you know, really um, helped me a lot. And different people who've done this exercise and been really um, uh, diligent about it. It, it, it makes a pretty dramatic difference, usually in about a month, but it takes some time. I call it the 49 chords exercise, which it's a three day cycle, dominant seven chords, mi minor seventh chords and major seventh chords. And I just look at the most default you can get Dorian for minor seven chords, uh, major scale for, for major seven, because Lydian's an alteration. So when Lydian happens, I want Lydian to mean something. Because to me, that gives me a much different sen sensation than, you know, you know, and I don't want to, if I'm comping behind a saxophone player, the reason why I don't want to make Lydian the default that's in my fingers and my muscle memory is because if I'm comping behind someone who's taking a solo and they go, 
you know, they play something like that. But I'm over here going like, woo, yeah, because I always know to play Lydian on major. You know, so it's, you know, for me, I go default. It's just the major scale. And then, of course, mix Lydian for dominant sevens. And so I don't think it matters what order you do this, but always keep it rotating. So it's a three-day cycle. So let's say day one, minor seventh chords. And what you do on day one, and I still, this sneaks its way into the slightly larger practice routine, at least a modified version of this uh, I still do. Uh, and I've been doing this since I was 12. A lot of information of this initially was given to me by Peter Stolzman, who's a great pianist and um, sometimes faculty member at uh, Stanford Jazz Workshop, which I've been a part of for 27 years. And But yeah, Peter blew my mind with this when I was, when I was like a kid and he gave me a lesson. He was like, what you can do is you can pick different notes in that seven note scale that work. And then he's like, create a shape out of that and then just move that shape up and down diatonically in the scale. So, you know, for something like, let's say we start out with the minor seventh day and we're on G minor seven. So we're dealing with Dorian. And so all we're doing is since we just have those seven notes, I'll try to create seven different shapes that are comprised of all different notes. That's the only parameter. They just have to all be different. They have to be within that scale. Then you take that, move it up and down 12, uh, or, or sorry, up and down the octave, you stay diatonic, and then, um, and then you create another shape. And so for each key, um, I'd call it the 49 chords exercise because the way that I did it was it, I would create seven shapes and then I'd move on to the next key. So for G, a quick one would be, okay, maybe you take a couple of these seven shapes could be right hand shapes, let's say. So maybe I go, okay, three note shape on G minor. And every single note goes up one notch at a time in the scale. So now uh, shape number two, and don't memorize anything or write it down or whatever. It's all got to be physical. It's a tactile exercise. So and you must be uh, you must be where I learned the whole concept of diatonic chords, because I, I remember in my mind it's a good chance of that. Yeah, I mean, I was I've I've been um, I've been uh, a pretty vocal supporter of this approach for <laughs> like a long time. Yeah, so. I mean the way the way you're describing it, it kind of brings these pictures of me being in like the the room. Suddenly, I'm remembering what the room looks like at the Berkeley Jazz School. And I feel right. like you probably taught me this exact concept. Um, and I've thought about, you know, the idea of moving voicings diatonically ever since. I think that in my mind, I was associating it maybe with Joe Gilman, but I think you must have taught it to me, actually. Yeah, screw Joe, man. No, I'm just I love Joe. He probably, I'm sure he gave you a bunch of great information. Oh, too. I mean, he's so much, so really much. Brilliant. Yeah, shout out to yeah. Joe Gilman. Absolutely. I love Joe, so I, I, I just, you know, but what I would do is, is I would, I would kind of come up with um, seven different shapes. Some of them, I, 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 some of them would be just right hand voicing. So maybe, you know, if that first one worked out, now maybe my second one, I'm just going to pick four. Now move that. And if you're a horn player, you can't play multiple notes at the same time. You got to arpeggiate these, and you get a lot out of that too. But so let's, um, so then I'd take some left hand voicings and, you know, um, literally just any different notes that might be in the scale. That works. Now this by itself, it's not considered a G minor seven, but what this gives you is passing chords, which make it uh, dramatically more melodic when you're comping. You can respond to different things better by having more options and, you know, moving that up and down. Now my left hand, there's a couple of these that I can't even reach. Um, you know, now my left hand gets to feel things like this, what that feels like. So if it was just G minor and my first go-to is this, you know, that actually ends up limiting a lot of things when you're comping for yourself, like that I would play in my right hand. If I play this in my left hand, then my right hand, like, it's so home basey that I can't, I'm like, I can't, but something like this, just even the actual inversion of, or, or the, the shape of that chord, the fact that it has no repeats in it, but also it's a little spread out, intervallically it'll make, it'll give me other ideas and things. And so getting shapes like that in your hand, or shapes that are a little bit more unconventional and harder to reach, you could take a big seven note or six note shape using all of those. Great chord that, um, now let's say, okay, let's say that we, let's pretend we fell in love with this chord. So 
you know, definitely move it. You also don't have to worry about if the first chord sucks, because if the first chord sucks, then it's a passing chord. And by taking it up and down, you'll run it through eventually a place where you'll come to a, a use of that chord that you really like. So let's say we fell in love with this, right? So we go around all, tw um, all 12 keys, we go up to, and we're only doing minor sevens this day, you know? All different shapes, created new every time. So, uh, you know, no pattern to it or whatever. Just pick different note, different note, different note. And don't worry if it doesn't sound good because you're just taking it through the system so your fingers have to work out the, the tactile landscape. So then let's say there's um, uh, day number two. I uh, can't remember what the chord I was using is. Uh, let's just say it was this or whatever. So day number two, you're going around a minor, uh, major sevens now, you know, and you're going... Uh, get done with E or whatever and you move to F and you're like okay oh wow there's that same chord from day one and so what ends up happening is when it automatically some of the some of the chords that just sound the juiciest and best they'll just naturally start popping into your muscle memory because you know a lot of times like we just play chords because it just feels good like there's some chords and things that just they just feel good to play and it's hard to explain why but it's like okay yeah I Something about that feels like I've had, and I think it's all the past memories of playing that chord where you had a positive experience and it's now associated with that chord. But you want to let that kind of a thing happen organically, which really shows that it's working. That means that this system of, of shapes, your hands are now getting used to different shapes. And a shape like this, there's no repeats in that. You know, so if I want to, if I want to change this slightly, you know, in anything where you tell, I'll, I'll pick a simpler chord, like. You know, there's ways of moving one note at a time. If you don't have any repeats, that's all you have to do. And so different things were. It might be one repeat that sneaks in there and stuff, but by the fact that my hands will usually uh, hunt for um, chords and shapes that just, they just, those are the shapes it knows to land on. It's just ones that aren't going to have many repeats and stuff. Then it becomes so much easier to be more subtle and nuanced with internal uh, voice leading. Um, also, some things like this, you know, it helps stretch the hand out to some shapes that are a little, a little wider. So, like, let's say we're used to, you know, we're play, re, someone gives us a chart and it says, like, B flat. B flat major seven sharp eleven over D, and you know which might be something like, you know something like that. And uh, if we're used to thinking, okay, chord play something over the chord, a lot of times then that ends up sounding kind of scalar. But my hands are used to more spread out shapes, so I usually if I'm gonna if I want to flourish or an arpeggio, instead of doing like you know, doing some sort of scalar thing, my hands might take a shape like this, and that might be the shape that I'm arpeggiating. You know, and so what ends up happening is those same shapes that after about a month, there's different shapes that start popping up in your hand, like kind of start holding your toothbrush a little differently and stuff. Like there's, if something feels different, it's like learning guitar or something. It just, there's the, the shapes are, your hands are starting to get used to different shapes. Plus physically it's doing the same exact exercise every day. Sneakily that exercise, it changes its context with the type of seventh chord, but it's the same physical exercise every single day. So inevitably, um, you're going to start to install better chords in your um, hands, which then show up in your arpeggiations. You know, if you're used to playing this chord over G minor seven, then a lot of times when you're soloing, you're gonna play something like. A lot of times there's things that we arpeggiate and play just as lines that basically are remnants of what was learned as a chord. Um, and so in my case, that shows itself with kind of maybe a little bit more um, angular, intervallically spread out things. Like that's kind of the sound that I kind of prefer to uh, play with when I'm playing. I really like to try to cover a lot of range on the piano. Um, and so, you know, also gets you from, 
gets you from point A to point B a little faster when there's less notes involved and brings some more clarity. If you were also, when you're arpeggiating something, I've found too, that it kind of leaves a trail, like the trajectory of an arpeggio, it leaves a trail of those notes. And so if there's a ton of repeats within that arpeggio, it's also not going to sound as good as if it was all different, you know? And so by having some of the shapes that you might arpeggiate, also be based on a system where your hands will actively try to avoid redundant notes, um, you're going to be in better shape. You're going to be in, you know, have a lot more options. And then all of a sudden, all of those mental things that go crazy when we're playing and everything else, it just feels a little bit easier to be tuned in on the nuances and subtleties. And I want to be, I want to be listening to like, okay, is, is it just my imagination or is the bass playing a little behind and the drums are playing a little on top? Let me, let me adjust where I'm at to make sure that feels really good. And all the same time, there's like a trumpet solo going and stuff that I got to be really supportive within that, but then aware of that clue and all that. There's just no time to think about like regurgitating anything. You know, anything that, um, anything to really respond in, uh, to, to what's happening and in, in actively interact i think it has to be derived over uh, out of the present moment for it to like mean something you know so that's why i'm like it brings me back around actually to like the idea of like transcription sometimes too which can be great for investigating um someone's approach and taking a dive into it and and um there's six or seven things that i've transcribed before in my life and 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 I got a lot out of sitting down and looking at different things, like how the rhythms were laid out. And I found it really interesting. Um, where it gets a little dangerous is those things like practicing a transcription into your fingers, then those kind of things end up getting out of context. And then those lines, you know, it interferes with the present moment because any of that wasn't, uh, it's all bits and pieces of stuff that, that happened at a different time, you know, that I, I, I think with some of those, you know, I just tried to make sure that... Um, you know, there's many things I l would listen to a million times that have probably transcribed my head, but I didn't want to necessarily get it into the physicality because I wanted my own. I'd rather make a bunch of mistakes uh, and and work that out and come up with something new and and within the moment because I feel like that generates some new vocabulary and things and it kind of um, you know keeps you on the search for new vocabulary and 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 all of that. But I mean, again, nothing wrong with uh, actively studying individual musicians. I mean, that's essential one way or another. Whether you call it transcription, you do that, or just actively studying the masters, like you, like people have to, you know, that's bread and butter you know like that has to happen and so for for me i just wanted to steer clear of like you know officially transcribing things i think the first thing i actually like transcribed transcribed was just a college assignment and stuff so i just i didn't you know for juries or whatever they call it um and i i, I just was uh and it's kind of funny i was in school with gerald clayton and one semester where we had to do that we both picked totally randomly out of the blue, the same exact solo to tr transcribe. So Gerald's one of my best friends. So, I, you know, we've been thinking alike on that. I think it was Jeff Keezer, uh solo on Caravan from an album, Ray Brown Trio Live at Starbucks, which is one of the greatest Ray Brown records he ever made. And it's, um, I mean, it's a funny title, but they did this live concert in Seattle. Kareem Riggins is on that. And um, uh, I believe I, it's either him or Hutch. I think it's Kareem. But yeah, that, I mean, that amazing solo. And so that was kind of cool. Um, what's kind of funny about that is, you know, I'm not exaggerating like or under exaggerating. I probably transcribed about seven things, less so of piano solos, maybe four uh, single choruses of piano solos. But the ones that I have transcribed, most of those are, it's still in my fingers, which just to me emphasizes the danger of it, you know, because if I can still play some transcriptions that, that were in my fingers in college, I know that if I had spent so much more time doing that, that there's a good likelihood that a lot of things that I would be playing would be kind of referential and not so much based in the present moment and maybe devoid of a little bit of, of, of new vocabulary. And I mean, we're in 2023. And so I think one of the things that like keeps this music going is the fact that like um, we're hunting for something new too and and going down so many different branches of the music and there's so many things to explore and all that and that's just the way that I choose to to explore that and stuff and 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 some folks prefer to have maybe a more uh, like traditional straight ahead jazz sound that kind of a thing uh, nothing wrong with that that's awesome you know and and folks who can do that well that's that's incredible, and sometimes there's a, a time and a place for everything and stuff. But for me, I've just really found a lot of enjoyment over the years of just trying to explore things, acknowledge the reflection of life itself with the 50-50 ratio of just knowing that there's unplanned events. And so 
this is all a long-winded answer in a way to the very first question you asked because it, it just kind of to me it all plays into it you know and and to be able to play something with clarity and and that sort of thing um to me those are the mechanics of what make that kind of possible but i mean transcribing again it's such like it's such a weird uh subject in 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 a different way and i'm the one like throw it in here and all that and everything but i just um yeah, i'm a, I'm, I'm a little different there than than a, than a lot of folks that um you know transcribe things and stuff and one of my favorite assignments actually was in college with um john clayton in his class gerald's dad um and john had an exercise for us we all had to perform a trio show that week at catalina's in la and um the goal was to loosely transcribe something like a trio arrangement of something but then capture that same energy without literally playing it you know like kind of watercolor it and i just thought that was an awesome exercise and a great way to go about it you know because it allows um for me i i uh, was something it was some monk thing or something and so you know i had to kind of find a way to channel some of that like monk energy and stuff and uh, although the my biggest pet peeve in life is like folks who do like a blatant monk Im imitation uh, like and then give you a lot of eye contact and stuff it's just kind of like no dude stop like we know what you're trying to do it's just you know like uh eye contact is hit or miss you know it depends on the people depends on the eyes but um but yeah like uh with that then i was able to just kind of play it in a way where i'm like I could listen in a different way. I could listen in a way where I'm like, I'm not trying to uh, clone you. You know, I'm trying. I'm not trying to clone that statement. I'm trying to see like, what did that make me feel like? You know, and then see how I can kind of put that information into uh, my approach. And and I really dug that. So and and the cool thing about John Clayton is um, I've taught at uh, his like jazz workshop over the years and things like that. And he knows that he and I. Um, we have opposite approaches sometimes with some different things, like maybe the location where the piano is set up even, like down to things like that. Or, you know, his his response to this would probably be, uh, to me saying, like, be cautious about transcribing. His response, I know, if he was sitting here, he would be like, well, better to sound like somebody than nobody. So, you know, there's always different ways of looking at it, you know? And, and um, the cool thing about that is, I think there's room for all of those different approaches. And plus, people are all different learners like there's people who are visual learners like i'm a visual guy um and i have synesthesia and things like that and so for me some of the unconventional uh things that i do are usually having um the sheet music inside the piano but i'm only using it for the peripheral vision of the font of the tune oftentimes you know like there's something about my color my charts have all these different colors on them and things like that and you know, for me, there's something about seeing particular colors that put me back into a zone where I'm remembering things and, you know, but everyone's different. And so there's some people who, if they got all the sheet music out, it might sound like they're reading or whatever. And in my case, I'm going to get so instantly visually distracted with my environment that seeing specific colors actually locks me in on what tune it is and stuff. And again, oh. basically not reading the chart at all, like especially for tunes I've played a million times. It's just... There's something about that where if I see that font, the font gives me that same energy of the tune. So I love, yeah, I love. Uh, that's really interesting, and I think you know we all have our own kind of organizational methods. So, two questions actually. This, this brings me to two questions. The first one, I'm gonna I'm gonna take one quick step back and say, I love your hot take on transcription as a practice method. I'm kind of curious, what is your take on play-alongs as a practice method? Do you work on playing along with, or, you know, rather, did you do a lot of playing along before you were constantly playing um, in bands? And what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Any good stories? So I'm, I'm, I'm pro whatever works for you works. It's great. But I'm, I'm pro, definitely pro play along stuff. There's some people that get on this whole like, well, but if you're practicing to a Jamie Abersaw, it doesn't react to you. And like, yeah, no shit. But at the same time, like, you know, it's spelling out the harmony and it helps you work through harmonic ideas. And, and I think it's an important um, practicing thing. I was telling you before, I think before we um, started recording here, that when I was living in Harish Raghavan's house, when I was living in LA, he and I would have jam sessions with Tony Williams by just putting um, a record on where Tony was on it and then fading the stereo channel, fading everything to the left channel where all you could hear is Tony. And so uh, we would play along to records. Um, I think playing along to records is really cool and fun too and kind of 
accomplishes a lot of the same thing, possibly in, in maybe a more exciting way. But Jamie Abersall, like those things I used to, uh, when I when I was living with Dana Stevens, when I was in Oakland and stuff, like we would, you know, practice together with those things and do all the, especially the ones that are like all 12 keys, because I think that plays into also um, eventually clarity on the instrument, because, you know, practicing different tunes in different keys, not only... Um, is just on a compositional level, I always have to, when I'm working on something, I have to take it into different keys and just try try it out because you never know where a composition is going to live until you know, you've know you run it through kind of a tester of like try it in different keys and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but practicing is really important in those other keys too because by practicing Cherokee in E or something, you know, then um, there's such a, a focus on original music these days, which I think is an amazing thing. Um, nothing's wrong with standards whatsoever. Like those are fun as hell to play too. I play those too. But um, I find that the majority of time, 99.9% .9 of the time, I'm usually playing either um, my originals or someone else's originals on shows that I do with the bands that I play with. Or maybe it's a creative cover or something or whatever, or maybe it is a standard. But, you know, usually there's all this original music. And so if someone hands you a, a chart, it's going to be a lot more like Cherokee and E than, you know, Cantaloupe Island in, in the default uh, in the default key, you know, like I think the unexpected changes that show up in people's original music by practicing standards in all different keys or practicing anything in all different keys, it's going to give your fingers a better chance to operate that tactile landscape in a way that's comfortable and all of that. Um, Jamie Abersall actually a um, couple years ago responded um, to an email I sent him 14 years before then. Like literally it was a reply. It wasn't like a new email. It was a actual direct reply to an email. I think I, I, I <laughs> wanted to talk to him about, you know, some of my weirder alternative piano methods and stuff. I was thinking at some point and, and still might someday put in kind of a book form or something just for people to have some of that information. I was talking to, I wanted to talk, I had met him at IHAE or something and I'd want him to talk to it. But yeah, he sent me this email and it was like, I was looking at the date and it was, um, well, I guess I got this email two years ago. So the date had on it, 2007, I believe. And it was replying to like, you know, and it was like, hey, he used the phrase, I've had a lot of stuff. On, I'm just clearing stuff off my desk right now. And I wanted to make sure I got back to you. And I'm like, what physical items on your desk prevented you from reading this email for 14 years? But then also, what a champion. He wrote me back after 14 years. Like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I, I will always have respect for Jamie and Ebersol. And I think it's I think it's cool. And come on, he's the best counter offer in the world. So it's... um. But I got a lot out of playing those things and stuff. And, and, and I would have, like, especially in times in my life where I was, like, roommates with different musicians like um, Joe Sanders or, or Dana Stevens. And, um, but, like, when I was living in Oakland with Dana, um, we would call friends over to, to just, you know, play through different things and shed together. Because I think, ultimately, this is a social art form. So uh, I think it's important to mention that no matter what you're working on, you know, listening socially and playing socially and practicing together, um, that's the ultimate, you know, that's, that's absolutely the ultimate. Cause then you can, you really have a chance to, um, make each other better, you know, cause ultimately that's what the performance itself would, would aspire to be. I always feel, it took me a long time to get comfortable with this. Like, you know, I, 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 I play as a sideman in a lot of people's bands and, um, Sometimes the nights where I think I sound the best, you know, and I'm like, I'm like, yeah, that was, you know, that was kind of, yeah, I got in there on that one or what, you know, like I'll, I'll kind of feel good about it. But then I'm like, I realized I was just focused on what I sounded like, you know, and then sometimes there's a disconnect where it's like the band leader, maybe they had an off night and maybe I wasn't as tuned in to that, that I need to be and stuff. And so then there's times where I think that I sound like dog shit and then band leader would be like, woo that was the one you know like and and because they sounded really good but that's the point you know i think if you play in someone's band you want you want your mentality to be focused around making them sound good and a lot of times that really also includes making yourself sound good because that reflects on them it's a part of the larger sound all of that kind of stuff but i always try to um make sure that whatever i'm working on or thinking about it, it comes from that mentality of trying to serve the larger sound. And if it's my group, same thing, you know, I think people like Miles did that where it's like sometimes Miles would be soloing and it sounds like he was comping for the rest of the band in a way, like it's just complimentary and it, and it, and it, there's this awareness, you know? And so, um, I think practicing with other people helps build that, um, uh, 
skill in a lot of ways, you know, is, is just getting used to making it about them. And then also by, you know, effect of it, like being a larger sound, you're also really making yourself better and they're making you better too. So, um, and I, those are my favorite musicians to play with as the people that where it's like, you can't even put your finger on it, but you just had a great gig. Like it just felt good because they made it feel that way, you know? So, um, I think those things like really leave an impact when you're, when you're, and, and create a, a sense of being like essential in a band, you know? And, um, and that sort of a thing. So those are the moments that I'm most proud of when other people, shows I've done with other people where, uh, where I thought they sounded really great because I was a part of making that happen, you know, and like that's really satisfying and more satisfying to me than playing like a, I mean, I, I'm happy with one of my solos, like one out of every 40 times or so. So like, it's pretty rare anyways, when I like one of my solos, but, um, but I've also learned to be at, at, at peace with that too. You know, like it, it's one of those things I always think of, um, kind of what would Herbie do? Like Her, Herbie, Herbie Hancock doesn't sit around after shows being like, Hey, you know, in that third tune, you know, like I want to talk to you about the bridge and blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, it, it, it came, it existed, it died, it moved on. We're now new present moment. And so Present moment driven music to me involves that 50 50 ratio, too. Of you have to embrace mistakes and the unexpected in order to truly live in the present. And there's, you know, all sorts of things, too, that within navigating all sorts of craziness in life, you know, and, and trying to stay right in the middle and, and expect a little bit of everything. Like the last, the last year of my life, I had a, a, a big breakup after many, many years, and which is heartbreaking. And then I won a Grammy. Like, a mm, couple weeks later, and then, uh, and then my mom died. Sorry, man. It, yeah, it, I mean, it, it's uh, it's a bizarre thing, you know. It's like those those crazy cool things, and then cra my my life has kind of been filled with a lot of that. Like, um, especially I, I started playing piano when I was really uh, young. I started playing when I was four years old, and um, when I was eight, I kind of started doing gigs and things. So I got kind of an early start. But my life has always had things like crazy moments where my dad died when I was twelve, but then when I was 14 i sat in with dave brubeck got to play for the president like things like that so i've been used to like growing up sometimes in life some really crazy cool things happen and sometimes some crazy crappy ones happen and so um neither one of those extreme good or extreme bad do you really have that much control over you know so um i think when you're playing in a way it's the same thing where you just kind of you know be at peace with be at peace and trust yourself with that unknown where you play a note and you play a phrase, you play a fragment, a chord that didn't fit, go with it, make it fit, uh, contextualize it after the fact and, and base the way that you do that on making everyone else around you sound as good as possible. Be aware of tension or release, make it human, you know? And so the cool thing about all of those extremes and everything else is that, you know, if you actively participate in music making during those extremes, um, you know, it helps you ride those extremes when random gig comes up and stuff. And, you know, I'm in Berlin and I get a phone call that my, you know, mother has to, uh, can no longer like do basic bodily functions for herself and things. And I'm like, now I got to go do this gig, you know? And so, uh, I think practicing in a way where you're open to the present moment really allows me to get through some of those moments and, and let music, let playing the gig be the thing that gets me through it. Um, Dave Brubeck went out and did a gig, I, I believe, on the same night that his firstborn uh, son uh, passed away, and um, and that's always been that's always been wild to me. In fact, actually, I remember a moment out at the Brubeck Institute uh, where I had a show with uh, Yosvani Terry. It was like their festival that was when it was still located at the University of Pacific, um, and. Uh, Yosvani Terry's brother died earlier that day, and we went out and did the gig, and I, I just remember being like. I couldn't, I, I just couldn't believe it. Like we were all kind of looking at him like, how are you actually doing this? And, and, um, you know, if you don't have a gig, then that's, I think that, I think that's when it gets way harder. I think, yeah. you know, he's able to work through something on his instrument surrounded by people who deeply love him, like great friends. That's, that's the way I've gone through all sorts of life stuff. Like, as I mentioned a lot more than that too, but plenty of stuff in the last year. And, um, being able to travel in, um, I play in Terrence Blanchard's band and, um, all the, all the folks in that band, it's like just really super cool human beings where I just feel like they're, uh, as much family as I have. So it's like, you know, the people that I play with and, and 
share those ups and downs with I, and express it musically together with them, that's who I consider uh, my family in life, you know, and I've had to kind of redefine what family looks like or what it means over the years. And, and so, um, but staying in the present moment and, and, and allowing some things to happen and just knowing that like, yeah, you played that F sharp, you can't go back in time and unplay it. So what happens now? Why was that F sharp the best thing that could have happened, you know? And sure, I'm not in those moments actively like thinking about each and every one of those little things. It's 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 more of a subconscious um, awareness of that and 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 kind of the um, knowing that that's that's in me those moments, you know. And and um, it's just not not panicking. I mean, there's been things too in an album making process where. I think all sorts of things simulate this 50-50 ratio that I'm talking about as far as improvisation goes. Like making a record, the last record, Tree Falls, um, I had six days of tracking for that record. And it was, um, first day was, first two days were supposed to be rhythm section. Then there was um, strings coming in on the third day, woodwinds on the fourth day, vocals on the fifth day, more keyboard stuff after that. And um, on day one, my bassist, um, uh, who also we play in um, Terrence Blanchard's band, uh, DJ Ginyard, he came down with food poisoning, called me at 4 a.m. that day. And um, first day of like six straight days of tracking. So I recorded that whole record like with no bass. And um, we just swapped in my MIDI, the bass from the MIDI file. And uh, I'll just, I will say that it is hard to make a record of like super layered, complex things over the course of like six days with no bass player <laughs> it was very um it was very frustrating and so but also dj is probably the most honest like amazingly like i would i don't have any kids but if i had a kid you, you could i would trust him with the kid's life like dj is just one of those kind of plays into why he's such an incredible musician too it's like you just this you can trust him. Like, I love that guy. And um, so I knew he really did have food poisoning. I didn't question him. There's other musicians I'd play with that, that if they say they had food poisoning, I'm like, I need to see the receipt. Um, but, you know, he, so we had to make this record. The silver lining of that, because I initially my, my first thought was like, hmm, should I panic? You know, maybe. And then I was like, well, no. There's going to come a point. I don't know when I'm going to say it or feel it, but there's going to come a point where I'm going to actually think the thought, I'm so glad DJ didn't wasn't here on this day because of something else. Like It has to be the reason why we couldn't have made that record without that happening. It turned out to be the case because um, he then had the rough mixes for like five weeks and before we could actually find a time to get him back into the studio and stuff. And at the time, too, uh, my co-producer was asking me, um, he's like, do you want to call someone else, get another bassist in and stuff? And this stuff was so specific to DJ sound that I, I, I had to, I had to make sure it was DJ. It was, it was designed for him, you know? And, uh, so five weeks later he comes in and he had been listening to the rough mixes for five weeks. He came in first take, second, second take, first take, first take, first take, second take. I couldn't believe what I was witnessing. He, uh, like a headphone tester take. He's like, let me just get the levels right in the cans that was the take of that tune. Like it just was because he, by having the roughs for five weeks, he was able to listen to all the little changes and nuances and things that are different than the chart or the demos. And he went in and just knocked it out of the park. Like it was, it was effortless. And so that was a silver lining of not having a bass player for, you know, six days of tracking a record. It, it's like, if you pick the right bass player, they can come back in, you know, after the fact and, and all of that. And there was all sorts of like weird little things to navigate about this, this, this new record that I'm almost finished with. But, you know, along the way I was prepared for that. So a lot of, um, unexpected events and then silver linings and things. And so on that macro level of just like the process of making an album or creating a big project or something, it applies just as much as it does when you're playing over changes and your finger does something weird or, you know, or you just want a new idea to come in and stuff. Like it's, it's really, um, if I had to play the same solo twice in a row, gun to my head, I'll see ya. I'm, you know, there's no way I can do it. You know, I just, I, now I let all that in. So I know that there's always some stuff that I'm going to play that I have no idea what it is. And that's, that's my comfort zone. Like doing an open intro to a tune. Like I love that. As long as I know a je destination, you know, there's always a way to, there's always a way to get there, but it is nice to have like maybe a shape in mind or a goal or a destination. So, yeah. Beautiful. That was a lot of tangents. Sorry. <laughs> hey, um, you're speaking to a, a fellow 
tangent master. So it's nice to, to let someone else do it for a change. Oh, yeah. Another thing that we had just very briefly chatted about before we actually started recording, and uh, actually I'll get to that, but you just made me think of one thing that a good friend of mine said, and he basically just said, you know, I was going through a, a bit of a hard time as well, and I was kind of telling him how I was almost annoyed that it was making me more musically inspired because you know, I've, I've almost had arguments with people in the past, like, you don't need to be, be sad to, to write good music. But I, it was almost annoying me. I was like, but it did make me write like 10 things faster than I have in two years. You know what I mean? Um, and he said a really interesting thing, which was just, you know, when life gets really comfortable, there is, you know, there are less different types of energy flowing through you. But when, whenever you experience any emotion, whether it's anxiety or sadness or anger, if you're a musician and you use your instrument, you're essentially allowing that en energy to flow out through the instrument. So if you're someone else, you might let it flow out by yelling at someone um, or playing sports, you know. Um, but if you sit down when you're feeling that energy, you know, you're, you're basically channeling the emotions right through. And I think that's probably why it feels so cathartic sometimes to just get up after playing, especially when it's been really emotional and you're like, wow, I, I, you know, some people process maybe by sitting and thinking and some, and some of us maybe as musicians, sometimes we process by actually just playing, you know, and being real. Absolutely. And, and, you know, the only thing I'd on some level I would add is that I think it's also okay for folks to know that, you know, if you are feeling super sad and or angry and you sit down to play and nothing good comes out, that's OK, too, because that'll definitely happen. You know, I think I think there's there's times where I've felt in a shitty mood and I sit down to play and I'm just coming up with a bunch of corny stuff that I don't like. And and then I just get even more mad because I'm like, not only does my life suck, but now I can't play, apparently. And like, you know, it's there's a lot of pressure you can put on yourself because you're like, but I'm sad. There it is. Like give me the emotion or whatever, you know, and, and sometimes it comes and sometimes it doesn't. And so, but I think it's okay. Cause it can be easy to beat yourself up sometimes too, with, with like, sometimes if, if, if like you're not able to turn it in, in the moment, I think when, when you were saying like, you know, like just going and creating 10 different things, um, I, on a compositional level, I, uh, I used to call it the rule of one out of 10, but I'm, I'm, I'm starting to think it's more like one out of 20, but I really think that, at the bare minimum, we all we we have to write ten tunes to get one good one usually, and uh, without those other uh, without those other nine, or in my case probably nineteen, <laughs> is more or less the correct ratio there. Um, uh, unless unless you go through those, you're not going to get to the one good one and stuff. And so it, there's no sense beating yourself up if you write a tune that kind of sucks too, because then there you go, put it in a stack, come back to it. I mean, I save all of the compositions that I've written for. Um, uh, you know, 30 years. I have compositions I wrote 30 years ago. Ah, oh, it's scary. I feel so old. But the um, but yeah, like I have compositions from dating all the way back and then, and I've saved everything. They're all in. Th so sometimes I'll pick up a big stack of stuff that I wrote maybe 20 years ago or something. I'll read through it and and I'll 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 grade it like a school teacher. I'll just be like F F B B minus. The bridge is okay, and then you know save that or whatever. And then digging through some of those ideas, there's always like little bits and pieces that are kind of cool. Or now now that your life is in a different place or you know it's a different context to hear that music, you know, so it means something different. Um, so, but by you know, I think one thing that you know, having an emotional moment can help with is, is getting some of that quantity out at least, you know? And so sometimes there will be moments, I've had moments of being totally dumbfounded, heartbroken, uh, you know, depressed, everything. And, um, and occasionally when you get a good song out, when you're in that state of mind, that really does help. <laughs> it's really nice. Cause then it, it just gives you that little bit of little little bit of a confidence boost and stuff you know there was there was um in the making process of this new album um uh which is going to be coming out in march of 2024 and when my mom passed back in last november i'm still in the process of trying to figure out how to plan her service and all this kind of stuff and initially it took a long time for me to be able to have the time and emotional strength to like read through some of her writings and things like that and kind of try to get to know my mom better that way and um 
And also I knew she had planned out her memorial service somewhere in there. And sure enough, she had. So that's eventually going to make my life easier. But some of the things in her writing, she was a frustrated writer. Like she had so many barriers and blocks to get her ideas out. She had dementia. So she she was very aware of her own me- mental deterioration. And she was aware of like all sorts of different, um, she, she kept writing lists of places she wanted to go and things that she wanted to see and, and things like that. And um, truth be told over the last like, um, you know, bunch of months and things, you know, I'll have good days and bad with that, you know, where sometimes you lose a parent and it wallops you and in different ways and that orphan feeling kicks in and all that kind of stuff. And so I'd have moments of like, you know, uh, extreme sadness where like also, you know, I sit down to play and nothing's really coming out, like nothing good is coming out, you know? So I started making it less about like, what do I need to create right here? And then I started looking at her words and her words staring me in the face were like these un- unbelievable, uh, some of her writings were amazing, you know, like had lines like um, writers write or so I'm told I'll do it all before I'm old and you have to tell my stories for me and things like that. And I was just like, you know, so then all of a sudden world of inspiration there, I put together a song that's on this new record that um, it's all phrases and sentences taken from my mom's uh, emails from her drafts from her writings. And, and I had Lisa Fisher and Julian Lodge um, uh, together, we uh, Lisa sung this tune, and there's a song in this new record with um, my mom's lyrics. But the tune came together once I started hearing her words, and so I think sometimes too, when you're angry and upset and sad, and you sit down to try to create something, I think sometimes we put so much pressure on ourselves to like we know a lot of us know that you know hey when you're sad you can get some good music out and all that you know but then that pressure kicks in and sometimes that generates its own weird emotional sense of writer's block but the second you can make you can look somewhere else for other ideas and just you know try to find something that inspires you or something you didn't notice about this bird's nest that's outside your front door or something else or just just something that like um that you can connect with that doesn't have to come from all this weight on your shoulders. You create everything, create something great. It's like, no, look around you and find things that, in, that, that could serve as that inspiration and be selfless about it too. And like get out of your own head and, and that sort of thing. So I, I know that really helped me in that process. Cause then all of a sudden, you know, I kind of had wanted to write a song for her and have it on the, on the record since, you know, um, she was one of my biggest supporters and all that all throughout time. And, but also I just didn't want there to be something that was, um, just kind of a generic tribute thing and all of that. I wanted to kind of get inside her head a little bit. And with Lisa, you know, Lisa Fisher, she used to be in, um, Rolling Stones and she's just, uh, we, we do so many shows duo. And I mean, she's one of the most incredible musicians I've ever, uh, played with or heard at all in my whole life. And, um, the way that she was able to kind of like scream on this tune, like get captured, captured some of my mom's kind of deep bottled up uh, energy there, you know, and, and, and that was, that was a really cool thing. So, I mean, the second I start to get mentality where like, there's some good idea bubbling, I'll really try to go with it and see if I can get inspired by what's around me instead of like forcing the inspiration out of myself and then give your music to the absolute best musicians you can, you can possibly give it to and let them be a part of that process. Let them make it their own and create, create it with, even if you've written the full structure of the tune and all that kind of stuff, you know, I always going into different situations. There's never been a tune that I've ever had a vision for and wrote where I give it to other musicians and my version of my head was better than what they did with it and stuff, because I tend to like try to adamantly play with the best musicians I can and stuff. And so I'm always in a sense of like awe and inspiration uh, of, of, about my friends. And um, and it's really cool. Uh, and I try not to take it for granted because those are the good things in life, you know? Like it's 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 possibly to be very, um, jet lag can really mess you up and just the constant touring and what you eat on tour and just everything else and just life itself and all of that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, to be able to just have the ability to create something real and trust the musicians around you is like, that gets me through a lot, you know? So, yeah, yeah. man. Well, thank you so much for sharing all that seriously. And, um, that's such a beautiful point to make as well. When I was like, Oh yeah, you, you know, all this stuff came out. It's such a beautiful point. You know, sometimes it doesn't. And that's totally okay too. Really glad you said that. I have, I have, um, thousands, thousands of, garbage ass tunes that I've written, man. Like just some of the worst nonsense, um, both when I was a kid 
and then one like within the last month <laughs> you know i've written stuff i've written so many bad tunes but really what it just means is i've written a lot of tunes and so then there's like a you know nice chunk of them that, that i feel pretty good about and stuff but it's really it's really like you won't get those tunes without writing the crappy ones too it's interesting i was listening once to john mayer talk about like his songwriting process where he's was saying where some days just everything just randomly flows and you get a tune out in 10 minutes and it's like one of the best songs you'll ever write and he's like then the next day comes and you could be like what business do i have sitting at an instrument doing this at all i fundamentally don't remember how to compose i can't play this all sucks and you know and then like the very next week then you'll have one of those days again where you can't explain like something just came in i've had some some of my best tunes kind of pop in in about 15 minutes in my head and there it was and then some of them have taken over 15 years to carve up and stuff and then finally record it once and never play it live or <laughs> you know you just never know they're all different so so yeah i mean and, and um but sometimes sometimes you can get some good stuff out and and that's what makes it all kind of worth worth it because you're like well i know that's in me i think fred hirsch did a lot of like timed comp uh, timed composing, you know, and, and that sort of thing, which I always thought was a really cool idea. Because if you give yourself 30 minutes or 40 minutes to create a tune, and once the timer goes, that's it, that's the tune, then to me, in a way, the pressure's off because you know there's a small likelihood, anyways, of creating a good tune, no matter how much you, you know, time you spend on it. But within 30, 40 minutes, yeah, it's probably gonna feel a little incomplete, and that's okay. But it just gets that quantity out. And, and um, I think composing is something that is, is as important as practicing, you know, you have to practice composing. And I think writing bad tunes is a form of practicing composing. When we're sitting there shedding and like practicing, you know, to get our fingers in a better place to play when we're improvising, same deal with the composing. Like, unless we practice it, like, what do we, what, you know, every time I sit down at the piano, it's not like I'm, it, it, every single time isn't on stage in front of a bunch of people. It's uh, like some of the times it's in a, um, at home or in practice room or sound check or something else. And um, I can't expect that in all of those moments, everything I play is going to be just as refined as what would come out live when the adrenaline's there and the crowd's there and the sound check's gone well and the monitors are good. You know, like that's different. And so with composing, like, you know, if I took some of the tunes that I consider to be like, some of my favorite best tunes that I've written, I can't hold all of my other tunes to that same standard, you know, because they didn't they didn't come from those circumstances and they had nothing to do with that tune. Every tune is just so different. So I do a workshop uh, that over the years I've done in a lot of different places. And I, I even did it over the quarantine over Zoom, which was, it was cool. It worked out, but usually I need a big whiteboard and a ton of Red Bull for this. But I usually do a speed composing clinic um, uh, where I, you know, in a room of a hundred kids or something like that, you know, I'll have people uh, shout out suggestions and I'll put it on the whiteboard. Like, you know, I need nine notes. I need nine chords. I need two emotions. I need a form, a structure, intro, yes, outro, yes or no, uh, time signature. And then I need like four sentences. And then so people shout out, especially it's really fun when it's kind of younger folks, because they'll shout out all sorts of crazy stuff. But um, those sentences I use to create the phrasing of the melody, I use those notes. And with a lot of Red Bull, you can get a tune out in 45 minutes that sounds pretty complete, that's built on suggestions from a whole crowd of people. And that has always sounded different every time I've done that class, because you know, all the suggestions are going to be different. It's going to be, you know, um, totally different from one time to the next. And um, but I think the cool thing with that is I all I also tell everyone there. I'm like, there's always a chance this song might suck, but usually there's a way to at least make it presentable in 45 minutes. There's a way to make a fully fleshed out tune with structure and um, all sorts of stuff. There's a way to do it. And the reason I show people that is to kind of, you know provide kind of like at least one way where there's a template to just get an idea started. So I think sometimes we get a little blocked up maybe in the, the initial phases of getting an idea out. And so there's a number of different ways where, you know, just to be able to like be at peace with an unfinished idea, you know. I have a hard time with that right now just in the context of I'm in the mixing phase of this new album. And um, just when you think we're done with the mixing and stuff, and I'm like, strings could still come up there and the guitar could come down, you know, and like that kind of, but like, I, I, you know, even there's been times where some of these tunes, individual tunes, three, four days of mixing, you know, like there's a lot of moving parts, but it's so hard for me to sleep on that 
on an unfinished thing. And so writing can be kind of the same frustration in a way where I'm like, damn, I just want to hear what this sounds like unfinished. And one of the hardest parts I've, I really consider about like making a, re- a long, a, you know, a pretty involved recording is um, the waiting, the patience, the just, you know, I'm like, Okay, this tune is this is good, but we gotta edit it. Okay, cool. And then okay, finally you get it the tune edited. Okay, now this is really gonna come together when we add flutes. Okay, so we get the flutes in there. Then I'm like, ah, yeah, I think uh yeah, Charles wants to punch his some guitar stuff. So once we get that guitar stuff in there, then it'll be cool. Okay, cool. Now we got uh, a whole string string orchestra day. Okay, so we're gonna add those strings. Now we gotta edit those strings. Now we gotta move that around. Now we gotta tune a few things. Now we have to, and it's like there's always this extra step where I'll like, I'll be happy then. I'll be happy then. And one of the hardest things about that process is, you know, having that patience to just say, yeah, it'll get there. And and you know, it's like it's just I feel the same way sometimes when I'm overwhelmed with like a lot of big projects at once and that I'm trying to finish while I'm like actively going back and forth to the airport all the damn time and like those kind of things where I'm like. Uh, I just want to finish that and finish that, but ultimately life is going to always have a lot of projects going on at the same time. So you got to be at peace with at peace with the unfinished aspect of it and stuff, and just know that be patient. Like it'll come together. So sometimes tunes, you know, especially if anyone tries that method of timed composition or something like that. Hey, if one randomly pops out to you that was pretty good, then cool, keep it and keep building on to it and that sort of thing. The whole idea is just to get um, ideas on ideas on paper and stuff. Like I okay. usually do that by hand, or I compose directly into uh, Logic so I can hear back what I'm uh, working on. And also, you know, wh- one thing that when I'm working on it on, on a tune, if I'm writing it in Logic or something, you know, I'll I'll do a quick thing of. Uh, I'll copy and paste it maybe six, seven times. Let's say I gotta go run an errand, I gotta go to the post office or something. So in logic, I'll 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 repeat it six or seven times and I'll start moving it to other keys. And then I'll quickly bounce that to Dropbox and stuff. And then in my car, I'll just pull it up and then I'll listen to the song in all of those different keys. Cause sometimes I'll be like, ooh, this has got a vibe in E flat that it didn't have in its original, you know, so things like that. And um, the time I get every day to practice might be kind of limited. And I do practice longer if there's like dedicated, super hard stuff coming up that I got to get in the fingers one way or the other, you know, and, and, um, and it's important to do your homework for gigs, you know, like, if, you know, if someone throws some music at you, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to show up unprepared. So it's important to somehow carve out the time if, if there's something you need to get in your fingers, that's really extra important. But now I kind of forget what I was saying about that, but um, <laughs> well, the, uh, yeah, there uh, was another tangent, I'm sure. So. No, no, all good. I, I was going to say, um, you know, you touched briefly upon just the sheer amount of touring and airport time you spend these days. So I'm curious, something that we had sort of chatted about for a second before we started recording, but didn't really get to dive into that I think will be a, a fun way to wrap things up here actually is uh, pack hacking. Yeah. What are some of your organizational methods and and touring tips for people who are going to start, you know, traveling around or might be doing some some gigs overseas or around the country? You know, there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of those things are things that I want to put in a book because I feel like there's 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 um, there's not too much um, guides out there to touring life. And right now I'm kind of in transition in terms of where I actually live, but I on the road maybe 90% of the time. So it's hard to really feel like you live someplace, but then, you know, being in whatever Marriott in Indianapolis or whatever on a given day, like Hong Kong, it's just, you know, I still feel like I'm not really necessarily great at, at, at figuring out a good balance with that and stuff. Cause sometimes it takes a lot out of me, but there are certain things I do consider myself a bit of an expert on. One of them is flight nerd stuff and people who travel with me, uh, have benefited from this, to be honest, because um, people people turn to me in times of need, and I have I have all sorts of systems that can help people like become platinum really quick and whatever and all that kind of stuff. It's been a great year. I think four or five people followed the Taylor method this year in bands that I play with, and um, yeah, they're all you know laying flat and lounge and all that kind of stuff. So the thing is, like when you really live in airports and planes, caring about like airline status is should be at the top of your list, especially if you're. You know, if you're not an instrument, if you're not a uh, uh, pianist, 
and you carry an instrument with you, you know, just to be able to be upgraded or to have like the flight attendants give you less hard, less of a hard time, but the overhead, all those kind of things. So caring about flight stuff and also getting in at an early age. I remember sitting down with James Francis when he was a student at Stanford, uh, Stanford Jazz, and he was, he was like 16 or 17. And so I, we went and I took him out to get coffee and I, I was like, listen, right now, you, on this co- ride to get coffee, you need to get a United number, Delta number, American number. And so I, I forced him to go through it. Now, if you talk to James Francis, he's, he's, he's a great expert about all that kind of stuff. You know, he's, he, he gets to be on the road getting people into the lounge on his behalf and getting other people upgraded and all that kind of stuff. And so when all you do is, is just travel, it's like those little things mean so much. Like on a 13-hour flight, getting a chance to just do this instead of this, you know, like little things, being able to, you know, feel more like a human because there's all sorts of times. I I remember a time where there was like a two and a half week stretch where I had three separate trips back and forth to Japan uh, from Japan and New York. And so uh, one of them was separated by one day. I flew back to New York for one day, picked up a new visa, flew right back to Japan and when I saw the welcome to Japan thing, I, I mean, it, which I had, I was just there like less than 48 hours. And I'm, I'm like, what in the world is going on? Because I was walking in Manhattan also yesterday, but then it just, and then by the time I had made the third trip back and forth, which is separated by another week, I mean, I didn't know my own name. Sometimes you show up and you're so tired from all the weird traveling and stuff. And then you get to a place and they're like, oh, hotels aren't ready yet. The rooms aren't ready. So then I just remember there's a lot of times touring wise where it's like be in Paris and stuff, just taking a nap on the ground, on the floor of a, a lobby of a hotel or something. And then like, you know, see people on Instagram or something. They're just like, Ooh, you should check out the Eiffel Tower or whatever, you know, like, you know, or like maybe on a ride from the airport or something, like you're just kind of tired and you put the camera outside the window and they like, yeah, so excited to be here. And, you know, and it's just, it's one of those things where it's like, but one thing that I can, that I can share, let me see if it works to screen share this maybe. Um, sure. Yeah. So I use this and out of anything in my life, I'm the most religious about this. This is my packing system, and I commit to it. I commit to it pretty hardcore. So we got a number of, like, clothing items, socks, pants, shoes, undies, casual shirt, concert shirt, belt, tie, whatever, things you might need, music, documents, electronics, other, check bag, yes or no, or a laundry day. So that basically, that sheet right there, that'll work for up to about 12, 13-day long tour. Otherwise, I have to copy that, paste it on the bottom. But what I do is... On the left uh, row, I, I'm like Tuesday the 11th, Wednesday the 12th, whatever. And I kind of like make a row. And then next to each thing, I put like show Estonia, show Romania, show uh, Berlin, you know, whatever. Go down the list and then basically just add up the numbers. So like I'm one of those kind of guys that like fresh pair of clothing, <laughs> you know, like, the, you know, socks and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, you know, pretty clean guy. So, you know, they'll be like, I can just put a notch there. I'll put like, I need one. I need one on this day. And I can look over it. Like, where am I that day? Okay, cool. And I try to race through this, you know, like for a two week tour, three week tour, I will, I'll just put, you know, figure out the numbers of all these things or whatever, total it at the bottom. And then I'll go run in there, pack only those things, not a drop more than that, not a drop less, commit to those numbers, don't even think about it. Because the thing that the thing that makes packing kind of frustrating is people sit around like, oh, what else do I need? And all this kind of stuff. Like, just lay it out, crunch it out. The people who have, who, who, there's a couple people that I know of who have adopted this and um, it's just quicker. And it just, you'll never forget to pack your passport if you have like a document section where you just like put passport there, like, you know, like, this is going to be one of those gigs where I need a tie or something, you know? So that's always going to be there for me. Um, and I mean, shoot, if it helps anyone, you know, go ahead and uh, download it. Who cares? But, you know, that's my, I really commit to that packing list. And and there's certain things like that that can really, you know, just be, they can just come in handy and be really helpful. Like, especially if you're, you know, um, especially if you're new to touring too, you know, if there's some folks who haven't like really, you know, I know a lot of people who are amazing musicians that maybe didn't, um, uh, you know, maybe hadn't had a chance to like tour really extensively yet and stuff, but then, you know, they, they're like starting to now that, you know, get a system together, you know, get a system that works for you and where you feel balanced and, and, um, 
But, you know, rewards, points, and airline miles and stuff, like, matters so much because it's... I've 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 been able to save bands uh, to before to be able to even get to a gig because of airline status, you know, where, you know, the highest status on Delta, like they were, I was able to get someone on a phone and while there's hurricanes going on and stuff and get on the last flight that leaves, get everyone else on that flight. And, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, if you're, if it's an airline where I don't have any status, like I, I hate those days. <laughs> it's cause it, it, it really makes it, um, I think people, sometimes they'll be quick to book those like, uh, really cheap uh, European, you know, Ryanair and EasyJet and things like that, or in the U.S. Frontier and Spirit, uh, which is just unflyable to me. Uh, I mean, because also then you end up paying so much more. But knowing those things, you know, if you're booking a tour and you book it with, uh, you put everyone on Spirit Airlines, you're going to end up paying more at the end of the day and everyone's going to be unhappy. So I knew I would find some way to reroute this pod podcast to uh, talking bad about <laughs> Spirit Airlines. <laughs> That's really the only reason uh, I, I still use Twitter is just to complain to complain to airlines. Uh, I mean, if you, you can do it on Threads too. Yeah, although it's supposed to be like all oh, what's your favorite cheeseburger kind of thing or what you know, like the Threads. It's you, who knows. Everyone's being all positive on it, like, but you know, it's kind of I don't know. It feels boring so far. So well, maybe next time we do a do an interview, we can see where Threads is at. Yeah, I uh, I mean, they got a lot of signups real quick, but then now I guess it's kind of leveling off a little bit because people are like, okay, so it's just Twitter with different fonts, kind of like, what's the point? So I don't know. But who knows? I don't want to be late on this one. That's why I signed up. So I signed, I, I was super late on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I was like a couple years later than most of my good friends and stuff. I was always just like, ah, I don't want to, I'm happy with my MySpace page and you know, I, I actually really miss MySpace because MySpace used to be a thing where even though we love to laugh at it now, it's like if you really look at what you had, first of all, you could publicly rank your friends. That's dope. Then second of all, um, you know, you could list your tour schedule or something like right on your page. You could have your own blog there. And and now we all eat out of the trough. Like whatever comes down the feed, even the term feed, it's so like barn-ish, you know, like it just, they're, we're getting it, well, what's on my feed that I got to eat. And someone else is like the algorithm or whatever that's thrown at us. And with MySpace, it was like, if you thought about someone, you know, you'd have to go to their page to like see what they're up to and stuff. Didn't so it felt like people music actually- music on too? Like you could actually have tracks on your MySpace page. Yeah. yeah. It was- dramatically better really myspace was dramatically better than anything that we got right now i i, I instagram i I'm, I'm okay with i like instagram I, that's the one that i actually use twitter i just go on to complain about airlines and facebook i post gigs but it's just like people like to get in arguments on that and I, i'm just like no thank you YouTube, so, uh, yeah youtube oh the youtube commenters are those are um hi to anyone who might be one of those watching this but um uh you guys are great Great folks. Everyone has their own equilibrium there, you know. But I, I think the method to getting social media flying uh, versus the method of like musical development and stuff sometimes can be a different approach. But there are similarities, like being diligent, being daily about things, being like um, uh, creative and organized and articulate and, and um, technologically aware and, um, you know, and, and, the time spent, you know, and the, the diligence and the, the perseverance and the, you know, the ability to field comments and respond to things and have conversations and stuff, you know, I, I, I think all of that is, it's, it's incredibly impressive. And it's also, you know, there are similarities along with those differences as to how to, you know, become a better musician and all that kind of stuff. And I mean, when MySpace was around, man, I was all over that, man. I was, I was on MySpace every day, all that kind of stuff. Now I'm just like, you know, uh, if something cool happens, cool, put up a little picture or something. Maybe there's some new, you know, little clip of some music or something. Great. You know, I just kind of, I mean, for me, it's just, there's, um, I'm fortunate to have the opportunities to be making music in person and stuff. And so, you know, that's the, there's, there's, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of like internet star musicians too, which is like, that's, I mean, it just, good for them to be able to put that much time and effort and work into that and everything. Cause people like me that perhaps could do a lot more of that, 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 that don't, the people who do it really well are the people who are like just as diligent, but then also like, you know, really great musicians too and all that kind of stuff. But they've gotten in the thing of, um, for me, I, the balance that works for me is like, I think there's something about, if I, if I 
if I fly to Switzerland to go do a show, I'm not doing that show for someone in Minneapolis. I'm doing it for the people in Switzerland. And so it's special for them. And so, you know, now I think with the quarantine, we all got used to being able to sit around and just fast forward. Everything's on demand. We could, everything's streamed to us. And like, no, now we have, we demand to be there too and all that. And that's great. But now it took out the special thing about like, why do you go to, why do you spend money to go to a live show in the first place? If you could just sit around and watch it at home, like on your computer, like it's weird for me. Like I don't like streaming things. I the the quarantine was, it, it, I mean, sucked for everyone. But like I just, I couldn't find any kind of you know. Um, eventually, I learned how to do Zoom lessons and things and have a basic setup and all that. Me and Kendrick Scott, like he, he, daily, we talked just technological ideas. That he was like, he's like, no, you need that cable for that. And we're working ourselves through like how to use. Um, uh, Ecam Live or, or or Zoom or set up mics properly or at home and things like that. I mean, the piano that I have at home, I was just like, that's the piano I practice on, not perform on. Now I have to perform on, you know, and tune my own piano, which is like I'd rather get divorced again um, than ever tune a piano again. It's just the worst. I have so much respect for piano tuners. So if any piano t- tuners hear this, I love you. I got respect, like... I've tried to do it and it sucks and I can't do it. It took me five hours to tune that sucker and it would like l- go out of tune immediately. I tried and, to and it was it was awful. I don't know. Uh, how, I don't know how they do it honestly. It's brutal, man. And imagine going all around town doing that. Like it's just you know it's 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 uh, but they are essential skill. as hell. Yeah, oh my god, it's a real, just, it, really you know refined skill. You know. Yeah. But you know that 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 the with you know deep in COVID when we were all in the quarantine and things like that you know I tried to uh, you know to some degree do some of that and I just kind of I didn't I didn't feel um, I kind of wanted to just wait and I've been so lucky that really since early twenty twenty one it's just been more touring than it was before the pandemic and everything. So yeah. like, um, I'm just lucky to do that again. Cause it, that's, you know, for anything else I do, like, I think I was put in the world to play piano and, and play it live. You know, like that's what I want to do perform. I'm going to perform until I, until I die until I can't physically perform. So, you know, it's just, um, that's all I know and love and, and, and I really respect the people who have figured out a way to be really successful doing it online and, and that sort of a thing. But also, I think people need to be mindful that, like, hey, if you're, like, let's say you're a great drummer that has, like, millions of followers online and you post clips of your drum solos all the time, uh, sometimes that might be a different intersection of people than necessarily the people who are getting called to tour all the time because... You know, if you hire someone to show up and they bring like 20 GoPros on themselves, like, do you want them in your band? Like, sometimes those kind of things can be at odds with each other a little bit. But I respect it either way because the people who are really successful at either one of those things make it their full on freaking thing. You know, like, like the people who are Internet legends and stuff and YouTubers at the highest level, like that's their 100 percent like day job, even if they're a incredible musician like in a way it's like that's their day job like they are that dedicated and i think the mechanics of like traveling and practicing and uh all of the other hats that we have to wear you know uh, along the way website designer graphic designer uh video editor uh mixer whatever yeah yeah like and 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 you know there's enough there that like then for me like the whole internet stuff also you know an interesting story that um it's played a game of telephone uh by the time chris told it to me but chris brubeck told me the story about like um how dave did did a show um it was like when dave was at the height of his um if chris ever hears this like he obviously could i'm getting all this wrong and he could tell this way better chris is an amazing storyteller too but he said his dad got asked to um play at this uh, center for people who have like PTSD and nonverbal people and I think Alzheimer's and that sort of a thing. And Dave, the nicest human being that's that might, probably ever lived. Um, did you get to meet him when you were there, by the way? Did you yeah, get to know him? Yeah, did several times actually. Yeah, special, special guy. Amazing guy. He, uh, long story short, one time, the first time I ever met him, he like brought me backstage. I gave him a CD very boldly. And then the next day he called my house and 
told me that he was, they were all listening to the CD on the bus. And I think I still have the, the answering machine recorded somewhere. It was just like, so he went so above and beyond to be inspiring to me. It was uh, amazing. Yeah, he was, um, he's a, he was a real rare human being, you know, that just don't come along very often. And, and, um, but yeah, he, he, um, this, this center for, for, uh, folks that were going through that, they asked if Dave and his quartet would come and perform. And, uh, and yeah, this would have been like close to, you know, when he was like peak fame, all that kind of stuff. But he said, yes, he was like, yeah, I'll do it. And they brought in a film crew. And so he played, and it was like the classic story of, um, you know, where uh, Alzheimer's patients and things, sometimes music can activate a different part of the brain. And so all these people were like nonverbal, hadn't said anything. Dave goes and travels there and performs there in front of them. And people were dancing and singing and all this kind of stuff. And it was, you know, it was amazing. It was like one of those great music, the effect that music can have on, on the brain and different things. And then apparently there was some year where um, they asked him to come back. He couldn't come back or something. They, they just played the film, the video for all of those same patients and stuff. No one moved at all. Like it was dramatically different because the difference of watching someone in a video and watching someone live, it's night and day. You can affect the show, you know, like even the concept that when you're sitting in an audience and you're at a show that you could yell fire if you wanted to and shut that whole thing down, even though please don't, like no one recommends that, it's a, that, that would be horrible, but you could, right? Like there's that, like the idea that you're in the room and your smell affects everything. <laughs> Good Lord. You know, like that. Yeah, that could be, you know, you definitely was like, ooh, who's, who's in the fourth row or whatever, you know, but like, you know, you know that you have a presence, your, your energy, your spirit of how you, you know, I wish that in our type of music, we had the budget of like the NBA where they had all those cool video screens at different concerts and stuff like where if people can't be there, you know, it's a way for their energy to be heard and seen and all of that kind of stuff. And I, I most of the gigs during COVID, you know, where it'd be like with masks and, and, and in some place with no audience or something initially, um, there'd be like this weird thing where you finish a tune and maybe the tune finishes with like a bunch of hits or something like, you know, like... And you finish it and it's like one of these things where you're so expecting like the uh, the applause of just like where you're like yeah you know it's like you finish it and you're like <clears throat> okay uh yep so uh, thank you <laughs> you know like it just was so naturally awkward and i just i couldn't get over the damn awkwardness like i perform live like that's only to, i need an audience you know I, I just can't like it wasn't for me you know and and um but I think that's okay. I'm 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 at peace with that, you know. And along the line, I, you know, there's different videos and stuff that I do put out and stuff and and uh, be involved in and all of that kind of stuff. But um, it was like I, I I know Jacob Collier and he I, I think he's he's a beautiful human being and great musical mind. But it was like the COVID made me hate him for a little bit because it was like he it's like oh man was he patient zero and he started all this? Cause he's already mastered all this, you know, like, like, like Jacob had completely, you know, uh, Jacob and Lewis Cole and some folks like that, like that just like had these incredible, like the video aspect of it was an instrument itself. And I respect that so much and everything. And then when I'm like at home trying to figure out like some sort of angle and then like where all of these other cables and like how, you know, there's no stores open. So I could do the equipment. I'd have to wait for the equipment. But it, I taught myself a lot about Final Cut and some different things like that. And so some of the other videos that I do put out and things like that, um, uh, it was a chance to just sharpen those skills a little bit. But I just didn't, um, I didn't like living I like social media, but I don't like living there, you know, like it's, it's, um, it, it's, uh, everyone's so different with that and everything, but I'm always in awe of people who have the energy and, and time and focus and abilities to, to, to be doing that all the time and all that, you know? And, well, man, I'm, uh, I'm constantly in awe of your playing, first of all, and your ability to, you know, just keep going. It's like a pro athlete, you know what I mean? It's like, how does this person constantly go on the field and perform at such a high level, you know, I think, yeah, maybe, maybe one could compare, I suppose, in a way like content creation is like that, that online side of it. But, you know, I think there, there is so much respect um, that I feel and that a lot of people who I speak to feel for musicians who are just going from place to place, bringing their all. And also like being really, you know, like you're, you're rawly putting 
yourself on display in a sense. You know, you are, you are um, participating in a very honest communication, right? Because music is really communication. And it's like we were talking about before, it's sort of like that transference of your energy. Like, especially if you're, if you're playing with honesty, it's like, wow, you're, you're giving that to the audience. And so I, I totally hear what you're saying too. It's like, you know, you're giving that to that audience that day. It's not like you're necessarily intending to just give it to everyone all over the place. And even if you were trying to do that online, there is still something different, right? Like that there's, there's something about the live experience where I think everything you said factors in, right? Like the smells of the people around you that, the probably, probably, you know, I'm no scientist, obviously, as I'm about to say this, but probably the, the mixes of chemicals and pheromones in the air and the, maybe even some, maybe even some kind of, um, invisible energy that's happening is all part of that. And I, and I think at the same time, when you are at a live show or playing a live show, all of that is contributing to what that show actually is. Like the same way you're in a stadium at a game and your voice is part of, you actually could change the outcome of the game, right? Whereas if you're yeah. watching on the computer, you, you really can't change the outcome. You could, you, could be a, you could be a streaker, you know? Like, you, yeah. you know, so, I mean, I think with that, it all also relates back to like what kind of what one thing that we were getting into earlier, which was that being okay with um, sometimes, you know, if you're not, the inspiration isn't coming, trying to get the inspiration from somewhere else, but be that like in my case, it was like reading my mom's writings and that unlocked a lot of things. I was trying to get all the inspiration for myself. But then when I read through her words, then something came out or let's say you're studying a particular solo or a musician and you're trying to, you know, even in the transcribing world or whatever, let's say you're doing that or, or whatever else, you know, you're, you're being in, you're actively being inspired. And for me, when I would perform with no audience, um, it's strange because that energy and kind of like that unspoken kind of undefined connection that exists that you're, that you're describing, um, it's like that's where a lot of ideas come from too, you know, like and the energy of that and the set list planning and like, you know, like where like, you know, let's do this one instead because I can feel the audience vibing with this kind of a thing more than, a, you know, I don't dramatically change my set list up based on the audience, but I will sometimes go in a slightly different direction if I'm like, you know, especially if you get like, you could tell that the audience really loves one particular thing. It kind of gives you some information where you're like, okay, well, I got another tune kind of like in that world. So they'll probably like this. Let's save that a little bit later or that sort of thing. So the ideas and the interactions, like how that's fed back in, um, God, there's nothing else that replaces it. Like for me, the virtually tactile feeling of like a crowd that's encouraging you, you know, and believing in you. To me, that means now I can get into a world of subtleties and nuances. You know, I don't have to hit them over the head with anything they're tuned in. So now that makes me get more nuanced and it makes me get extra small and extra big because I want to give them all of the extremes and I want to reflect life for them, you know? And when I'm just staring at like just the camera and no, you know, the audience, which thank God it's been a while since I had to do one of those audience list <laughs> things again, you know? Um, but also, you know, it was weird. The first gig back after um, lockdown kind of ended, the, 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 it was about, a, you know, 14 months, I'd say, in between shows that had a live audience at it uh, for me because, you know, February, end of February 2020, really, it was just like, then I got stuck at home, uh, as did the world. And, um, but then April of the next year, ironically, at the place that I did the last gig before COVID um, with Lisa Fisher, Duo, we did the show in Connecticut, and um, uh, that was my first time back with a live audience. And just it just felt good to even be at Soundcheck. Like it just like everything about it was, and also it just felt pretty normal. It felt like I was like, oh yeah, that's it. Felt there was something about it that that um, just felt good. But I'll tell you this: the audience was rusty. Um, it, you know, there was a lot of people shouting out and a lot of people shouting out requests and you know occasionally that kind of a thing happens and stuff. And Lisa's a superstar, so she's gonna her her. Her, uh, one of her most famous tunes, uh, How Can I Ease the Pain, you know, is a song that a lot of people, when they go to a Lisa Fisher show, they want to hear that song, and we do it. But we, you know, it was like two tunes into the set, and someone's like, I want to hear How Can I Ease the Pain? And, and she's like, um, okay, yeah, sure. I mean, we were like going to build up to it. We had a whole set list, you know, and those people wanted to hear it then, so it was like, okay, we did it kind of early. And then like two tunes later, 
someone shouted out like, I drove four hours here. How can I use the pain? And we're just like, so where were you two songs ago? All right, well, play like Lisa's like, here, I'll hum the melody again for it. You know, but it was like audiences, the process of being in an audience like that was really foreign because people had that on demand mentality. They were just like, they're going to no, not that tune, a different one. It's like, no, this is not we all pick the set list day. That means like we have a story to tell you guys and like let it unravel. Like that's the difference between us on stage and the audience is we get to be the narrator, you know, like, and so give us that license and stuff. And so I noticed that for like months, there was different gigs where it just was like the audiences were a little rusty. Also, you know, a lot of people I'm sure also noticed this, you know, like COVID and just post COVID gigs, when people are coming back to, you know, go to live shows in the audience, there was a lot of situations where like folks kind of sucked at clapping, to be honest. Like it's, it, you know, if you were sitting at home during the COVID lockdown and you were clapping your hands for any reason, you're a sociopath. Like there's something wrong with you. You're probably a serial killer. Like no one claps at home by themselves for no reason. Like the physical act of clapping, people were rusty. They have to shed. So like when you go out to a show, then you're just like, oh, do I, is it this? I forget, I forget which way it was. Maybe it's this one or whatever. And people were like clapping like there was a towel in between their hands. Now it feels like people are back. You know, like these days, folks are back. They're yelling and having fun and clapping and all that. But but just initially, it was like a really weird... The pr There's a protocol to go into a show, you know? There's like... Um, also, I, I ended up having so many great conversations with people over that time about that, where there was like people missed out on the social aspect of going to a show. You go to a show, you have a drink with a friend before or something, you meet up with them, hang out, and then you can go to the show together, listen to it together, talk about it together. So the audience audience to audience, there's a connection there too. So, so um, you know, which which I guess got simulated to some degree with like comments or a live chat when there'd be a stream and stuff. It's just not the same. Because if there's anything that, you know, we've been saying earlier about the YouTube comments and things like that, when people put things into text, it becomes sometimes more powerful and sometimes people don't read the nuance in someone's voice when they write something. You know, like um, uh, if, if, if someone wrote... Um, you know, if someone wrote to, it's like uh, uh, adults of a certain age, like 50 plus, that use periods in their text, like too often, like where they're, you know, where I'm like, you know, hey, like, you know, like, looks like I am free on that day or whatever. Like, is there any chance like I could maybe come in the day before or whatever and all this, you know, like I'm talking to someone about some logistics and then they write a text back like, sure, period. And I'm like, the hell do you mean by that? You know, like where it's like, whereas in person, they could be like, oh, sure. Okay, cool, fine. But when you write sure with a period and that's all you say, then it's like you sit there overthinking it and looking at it and then writing an angry comment back like, what do you mean by that? Like, of course, you know, I would have expected nothing less than you to, with this attitude and all that kind of people. It's hard for people to like communicate through written words at times. And so chats don't do it justice. Comments don't do it justice. To see a show, you got you you, you got to go to the show and go to go to the show with your friends, Absolutely. you know, like. I think that's a, a beautiful note to wrap up on, Taylor. Um, <laughs> cool. Huge shout out to live music. Yeah. And um, also, for anyone who is listening to this or watching this, if you have not yet heard Taylor's music, first of all, immediately go listen to it. And if you have not actually seen him play live, which is where all the energy is, um, you know, not to discount the energy that is clearly on the records as well, but make sure you do that. Make sure you follow Taylor on social media um, and check out his website for tour dates because seriously, if you have not seen Taylor play, you are completely missing out. Um, Taylor has been for a long time and definitely is easily one of the greatest jazz pianists on the planet for sure. Um, so Taylor, where can people check you out? Uh, what are your social handles and all that? Thanks, man. Um, well, to keep things easy, pretty much everything's just, you know, at my full name and all that, or my full name.com. Not literally my full name.com, which is, <laughs> I'm sure probably routes you to something that you don't want to go to, but um, at Taylor XD or any of those things. And um, the website keeps the tour schedule really updated. And, um, and sometimes I put out little blasts about upcoming shows. And, and one reason, you know, if you don't come for me, come for 
these amazing musicians that I really, that I get to play with, like with all the crap going on in life and everything else, this is just like the thing that I'm most thankful for is I get, I get a chance to make music. I feel really passionate and proud about, uh, with some incredible musicians who are like really good people. And that's like really important to me. Um, and, and, uh, you know, I'm just so excited when like shows that I do with, uh, Terrence Blanchard, um, E Collective and the Turtle Island Quartet, just to see that show live is, is, is awesome. And I'm just a small part of it. You know, it's like, there's nine of us there and, and everyone there is ridiculous and things like that. So, you know, coming to a live show, you know, screw any videos that I put out, just come to the live shows, you know, cause it, it just, that's where the, that's where it, it also, you know, the cool thing about live shows is it, it, it'll always be different every time, you know, and you, if you watch a video of something, that video is always going to be that video. So, but live, that's where the fun gets fun and, mix it up in different exciting like you know surprise guests all that kind of stuff you know so um i do hope that people can come out to some shows and stuff because um um yeah we spend so much time on <laughs> at the at the computer and on the phone and it's just live being able to play live and and have that shared experience is uh, means everything to me so yeah well, that's awesome man. and i and i love that you've been so open about sharing about your experience too and, and perspective because on my podcast and channel, we spend so much time nerding out about like music theory, but I think we haven't really had many chances at all to actually talk about what's it like being a musician and what is it like for the musician to have a passionate audience and what, you know, how does it affect us to actually have a comment that come, you know, at the very least comes across whether intended or not as kind of unnecessarily mean, basically. Um, right. These are all really amazing conversation topics. Thank you so much for, um, you know, diving into that with authenticity and honesty. This has been such a great episode. Really, really appreciate it, man. Really appreciate you being here and sharing your wisdom. My pleasure, man. And, and good luck with everything, man. You, 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 you got all sorts of extremely important and cool information to share with folks. So Thanks. I, hope, uh, I hope that just grows and grows and, and you're doing amazing things. So yeah. Thanks. Dude. I really appreciate that, man. For sure.